In 1989, RTE decided to launch an urban soap, following in the tradition of Coronation Street and East Enders. The first episode was an hour long and set in a fictional area called Carrickstown on the north side of Dublin. You'll never live it down, Ma. The front page and all, you'll be the talk of Ragnall Place. Do I look all right? You look great. What do you think, Dad? Embarrassing. I know Glenroe was at the height of his fame at that stage, and they had Glenroe and they had Bracken before it. So I think they were trying to get the polar opposite. We were definitely from the north side. Over a million viewers tuned in and were introduced to the key families around which the drama would unfold. We used to shoot it in Ardmore. We'd come into television, just studio wasn't built in those days. And we'd come in here uh, and we'd get on a bus and they'd bring us to Ardmore. And we'd rehearse in Ardmore and we'd shoot the interior stuff in Ardmore. And then we'd shoot the exterior stuff in Drumcondra. And it was directly on the flight path to Dublin Airport, which was a great help. Because every three minutes you had an airplane landing and coming over, and so we'd have to stop, you see. So you had to try and get the scenes in between the airplanes. One of the four scenes I remember doing, and it kind of set up the character, I think, in many ways, was uh, Barry coming into the house to his mother, and he brings in his washing. Hi, Ma. Oh, Barry, where did you get that awful tie in the photograph? The navy one with the crest I bought you for Christmas would have been so much nicer. Yeah, as you can imagine with the first series of the first episodes, so to speak, they were setting up the characters. So by showing Barry bringing in the washing and all, I kind of set him up as this kind of mommy's boy kind of thing. You'll stay for a bit of breakfast, No, you? Ma, I just brought the usual. Am I good trousers and cream short ironed? While Barry O'Hanlon was set up as the Irish mammy's boy and potential priest, Paul Brennan was the young man with an eye for the women, a role that he's still playing 20 years on. No, I'd rather walk. Have a word with you, Paul. Mother boys engaged. Can't you see how mother boys engaged? It was started off by the, the guys who started off EastEnders five years before, and EastEnders had been such a hit that they kind of went, OK, yeah, we'll go with these guys. So they were kind of coming over from London from the East End of London over to the north side of Dublin and it was kind of near the twain with meat kind of thing, you know, it's a different idiom. We speak different, we have a different sense of humour and different people. Do what your daughter says and stay out of it, da, please. Cheeky little... They eventually brought the Irish writers in, Irish storyliners in and um, Irish producers in and kind of went, OK, let's kind of ground it. It took a long time for it to settle, but then you get the right mix, you know, stories, the length of scenes, the, the, the number of scenes, the, the characters, the actors, and all the elements come together and it clicks. One of my favourite things was in the early series. Myself and Paul, Tony, ran the marathon. So they had this holiday of us training through the four series. If I remember correctly, I was pretty fit at the time. God be with the days. I was pretty fit at the time, so I was actually great, but it was great, you know. And um, the Sunday before the actual marathon, we shot some stuff along the canal and had extras and had a camera on the back of the motorbike and we were running along and went to another location. It was all great. So the whole day shooting, inserts. Then on the morning of the marathon, which was a Monday morning, and the episode was going out that night, we shot stuff at the marathon, warming up with the numbers, the crowds, people going by, blah de blah And then like an aerial shot of everyone starting off kind of thing. So once everyone started off, we shagged off back to the mansion house and had tea and crumpets with the Lord Mayor, kind of thing, you know. And then when the marathon was over, we wandered out two half hours later and oh, threw ourselves <laughs> off the line. They rushed the footage back to RTE, put it in with the stuff they already had, and they showed it that night on the TV. Oh, God. In the first series, we saw Rita Doyle struggling alone with her tribe of children. And it's not until the next year that her errant husband, Bella, comes back to Carrickstown. I got a call from Niall Matthews, who was then executive producer. I wanted to know would I come into the series. Terrific. Exactly and I wasn't too sure, because at the time, it seemed to be still trying to find its feet. Well, he said, come on in and meet me. So I went in and met him, and we had a talk. He said, look, Jim, the character, I break it down for you, he's a bit of a wanderer, right? He's been away, he's coming back, and he really can't settle down. And he's a sort of, he's not a nasty bad guy, but he's irresponsible in that, right? 
I said, yeah, come on, come on. He says, and the name, I said, what is his name? He says, Bella Doyle. I said, OK, I'll do it. He said, what? I said, yeah, Bella Doyle, magic name. Thank you very much. I'll do it. So I did it. I'm 20 years in university this year. Started when I was eight years old. I grew up, you know, like everyone has snaps of them as a baby. I've got a whole show reel of embarrassing hair. <laughs> well, Mrs. McCoy, this is it. It sure is. In 1990, Kay and Noel McCoy opened their refurbished pub, the setting for much of the drama of the coming years. Hey, Warren Lily, shut him up, Joe. I'm here, Noel. God, it's going to be great. Not having to put my hand in my pocket for once. I know, I know, I know, but if I know, I know. You have a storyline, like at the moment we're in for five weeks and those five weeks are so intense, so you know when you're in, you can forget about everything else and that it's 20 past seven in the morning until, you know, whatever time at night time. So it's really, really hard work. Today I have uh, 11 scenes right on the trot, so you have to literally walk around with your scripts, you can't go because you know, you just know that you're going to be called, I'm going to be called now at any second, and we have to go down on the floor, and that's just the way it is. So it can be extremely, extremely hard work when you're in here, you know, and your time is not your own. You just have to be on call. Now, can I just ask... Bella may be back home with his family, but that didn't mean he had to change his philandering ways. He begins a fling with the local girl, Linda O'Malley. That's why I'll always be around you. Bella was always a bit of a mug, right, when it came to women, always. It was a challenge to Bella every time he'd see a pretty girl. Doom, 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 doom. And he would be down that road and wouldn't care what the consequences were. Hey, what's all this? You're planning something I don't know about? Don't be so daft. These are for Linda. What are you on about? Linda O'Malley, she's back. Oh, is that right? Yeah, she's expecting. Linda O'Malley's pregnant? She's well on, poor girl. Some Galway fella. I think they're a typical, um, my dare I risk it, Irish sort of uh, relationship, is that it, it taking for granted, you know? I mean, he just took her for granted and took everything for granted, thinking everything is great. I'm the father. It was never anybody else. Just you. I have to go. Right. No, I'm sorry. Just take care of yourself, won't you? Realising Bella is a non-runner, Linda starts dating Barry. Always the soft touch. I see Barry as a kind of a good-hearted, a nice man who's unlucky in love. You know, there was Linda. She... <laughs> if people heard you talk about this, she was pregnant with Bella's baby and I took her in and the baby. Linda, wear this ring as a symbol of our faithful love. In 1992, Barry makes an honest woman of Linda, happy to pretend that baby Alice is his. But their happiness is short-lived as baby Alice becomes critically ill. Doctor. Doctor. What's gone wrong? Well, the heart isn't pumping enough blood to the rest of the body, you see. When death is inevitable, some parents prefer not to prolong the suffering and to let nature take its course. It is only a matter of time. That was a big strain on the relationship, as you can imagine. So that didn't last too long afterwards, after the baby died, and, and we split up and eventually got divorced. <gasps> Next week, same time, same place. The next year, Bella is back to his old ways and finding comfort in the arms of another woman. And this time, Rita finds out. It's time you all realise I want no part of you in this house. Just wait a minute, Rita. I am not budging till we have this out. Now, this is my home and I have every right to be with my family. That wasn't your family you were thinking about when you were running around with that lying little trollop. Rita, you're blowing this out of all proportion. It was just a few harmless meetings with a lonely little girl, that's all. And what about the others, the ones in England? God, this stupid business has you imagining things. Yeah, that's what I told myself. 
He can't go accusing a man just because he dares himself up to go out with the lads. Oh, Rita. Or bring himself to touch you, or look you in the eye. Come on, Rita, don't put us through all this, will you? You're the one who put us through, Bella. It was nothing! Nothing? If I was to twist that knife in your heart, maybe you'd understand. Do you not realise I love you? Get out of me, sight. No. You are not driving me away from here, Rita. Do you hear me? Never. Gran, I better go in. No, no, leave them, leave them. If you don't get this stuff out of here now, I'll dump it on the street. No, no, come on. Don't say another upset. word now. So help me God, I won't be responsible. Stop it. If you don't stop it, I'll tell. You'll tell no one, Dora. I'll tell me father. Her father. She'll tell her father. Maybe she can find him. I horse your man off with another owl. That rice is on. No! You've no one to tell, Dora. Because your dad isn't there. And he's not coming back. Because he's not left. Is that right, Suzanne? I think Suzanne was about... 11 or 12, I think, when Rita and Bella broke up. And there was a storyline where Suzanne ran away and she went to Bella's bedsit and a woman answered the door, Irene. Hello there. Can I help you? Is... is me dad not here? Your father? Isn't he here? No, he's still at work. Maybe I could help you. No. I want me dad. Look, what... Me Suzanne was very upset by that and um, ran away and spent the night sleeping rough somewhere. Mm. So she did witness it. <laughs> in 1994, they spent money building this soundstage we're in now and soundstage B, A and B. And also they decided to build a street Fair City Street, so as that they could shoot in the street without going outside the complex, which meant that they weren't bothered by traffic or the public or anything, they could control everything. And by doing that, they could do more work. So instead of doing a half an hour a week, we did an hour a week. No, they're just going, I think just going into a car right there. Oh, okay. Close your eyes for a second. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of to blame for Carol. Carol has created Carol's look. And my black eyeliner. Which we're just about to. Yeah. Ash kind of likes to do herself. Yeah, because she's it's... control freak. No, I just don't <laughs> like to have things stuck in my eye. <laughs> she kind of wears brash clothing and brash. It's all and big earrings. You know, she's very OTT in general. Yeah. So we kind of just went OTT with her makeup. Then it's kind of, we, we, just, we just like it, don't we? Yeah. And also, I play older than who I am. Exactly. <laughs> we age you with your makeup. Oh. Speak the devil. <laughs> Hi, Helen. Helen, this is Nicola. Nicola, this is Helen. In 1995, Paul is dating strong minded Nicola while sharing a flat with Helen Doyle. And as usual for Paul, he's not sure which way to turn. Helen and Paul shared a flat with Barry and uh, I think uh, that's where the romance blossomed. However, he manages to get himself engaged to Nicola. But all I want is a bit of extra time, that's all. The time to do what? Either you love me and you want to marry me or you don't. I thought you were going to bed ages. He realised, I think, in the last few weeks leading up to the wedding, as I'm sure happens a lot, that uh, he was marrying the wrong person and he, he loved her. He didn't love her as much as he loved Helen. You know, Nicola, She's everything I could possibly want. Except for one thing. I'm in love with you. So he did a lot of drinking. Beforehand. As you do. Late at night. I've only just realised. I've always loved you. You shouldn't have said that, Paul. It's not fair. Why not? Because you don't mean it. But I do! You're drunk. She obviously loved him as well, but she wouldn't let herself go the way he did after a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> I suppose his life partner would have been Helen, and she was softer, but I think he was led by the hair. Yeah, when I had hair yeah, up the aisle with, with Nicola, because she demanded that he, marry, that he marry her, and, and he followed through. Did you get a puncture? No. So what kept you? I am. Um, I got delayed. Daddy, could you leave us for a minute, please? Well, you know we've been driving around the block for the past 20 minutes. I'm sorry. I was beginning to think... Come here now, so let's just do this, all right? You weren't going to turn up, were you? 
There's a church full of people in there and we've kept them waiting long enough, so come on. Paul does marry Nicola, but the love triangle between Paul, Nicola and Helen will be an ongoing story for many years. Do you, Paul Dennis, I do. take... And do you, Nicola Ann, take this man, Paul Dennis, to be your lawful wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward till death you do part? I do. There is drama in the lives of Mags and Charlie when their son Tony arrives back from England. Tony, you see, found out that I wasn't his father. And this upset him greatly. Charlie's not my father. What? My real father moved to England before I was born. And he left Ireland. And he went to England, went to Liverpool, and he got into very bad company. And he owed the money. And he came back to Ireland, and they followed him over. So just give me the money, and I'll never have to see your ugly face again. What if I can't? Then your ugly face. Then eventually, outside Mackay's pub, up on the lot here, one of them catches him and produces a knife and uh, stabs him. Your old man has a business, doesn't he? Tells me he's doing real well. You leave him out of this. Ah, oh, touched a nerve, did we? No, I swear. You go anywhere near my family and I'll... Tony! Hey! That's your old man now, isn't it? Let's go and talk to him right now. No. <laughs> and of course, Charlie comes out of the pub and they're all upset and everything. It was a very good story. And I was very, very sorry to see Derek Kelly, who played Charlie's son, leaving the series because he was such a fine young actor, you know. Tony, Tony. <laughs> Yeah. 1996 saw Fair City tackle an issue that was to be a first for RTE, a gay love story which features a kiss between Owen and Liam. Well, almost a kiss. I saw you Mackay's the other night. Oh, really? Yeah. You were with that uh, rep fella, you know, the drinks rep. Liam, isn't it? Yeah. Seems a decent enough lad. 64 pence, isn't it? Yeah. I must be very lonely for him all the same, you know, going around in his own from place to place. Sorry, what is all this exactly? What? I'm only making conversation, that's all. I don't think so. I think it's a, is Owen really gay conversation? What? Well, the answer is yes. I am what you would have probably called a confirmed bachelor, a puffter. I am gay, queer, bent as a threepenny piece. Now, any more questions? Pascal arrives, looking for a job as a barman in McCoy's. Yes? Could I see the manager? Is there a problem? I'd like to see the manager. Is that not clear? Well, maybe I could help you instead. My name is Mr. Mulvey. I'm here uh, for the interview. Ask not what your sweetheart can do for you, <laughs> but rather what you can do for your sweetheart. Another new character is ladies' man Leo, already on his second wife, Sandy, the nightclub singer. I think the core to Leo's character is the fact that he's honest. He's not a devious man by any means, you know. What you see is what you get. There's only so much a girl can resist. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Young Neve Cassidy is new in Carrickstown. She sets her eye on school teacher Barry, who never stands a chance against her schoolgirl charms. I was cast as Neve when I was just, I think I was about 19, and I was doing a show in The Project with Dublin New Theatre. Well, it wasn't always a boring teacher, you know. Well, I don't think you're boring. <laughs> Have you just seen me then? <laughs> yeah, so what kind of things did you get up to? Ah, no, that'll be telling you. Well, I can keep a secret. Yeah, so can I. That's why my lips are sealed. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, that story, you would get a response from the punters, the viewers kind of in the streets, and they wouldn't hold back and let you know uh, what they thought of you or your carry on and that could be a good way or a bad way but with the the school teacher now the affair with the pupil kind of thing there was a bit of you know leave that young one alone or you'll get into trouble or you get her into trouble or whatever like you I mean so there's a bit of that going on yeah well uh, that's a uh, great news about the exam uh, she was going to buy for grinds and she must have had other kind of grinds on her mind it's a bit stuck there the she came in as Neve's mother, and Neve at the time had been having um, a sort of sly flirtation with Barry, the school teacher. And uh, of course, I thought this was outrageous, outrageous. The school teacher taking such an interest in my daughter, who was doing all the, um, you know, I'm making all the moves, of course. 
You're my pupil. What you feel or I feel isn't important. I don't care what other people think. That's easy for you to say. But it's my job, my livelihood that's on the line here. Now, I'm sorry if that sounds selfish to you, but there you are. I'm the one that's going to have to face the music. Because they'll say that I led you on. I took advantage of an innocent young pupil. And who am I to argue with them? Because they'd be right. Helen went away and went away to work in London and Paul went over after her and uh, secretly and he Listen, found her working in a hotel and um, one thing followed another, I think they had a night together and uh, she got pregnant. Helen, you're driving me crazy for God's sake. Will you just give me a straight answer, will you? Okay. It is your baby. Satisfied? But it doesn't change anything, Paul. It's over. But with Paul still married to Nicola, Helen tries to pretend that it is her new boyfriend, Mike's child. I think we can move you to the delivery room. Are you the father? Um, no, we, no. Right, you can wait outside, sir. Nobody knew that Paul was the father, and uh, she went into labor, and Paul had to bring her into the hospital. And the great thing about doing that scene was when he actually had to bring her into the labor ward, she was having the baby, and he wasn't allowed in That's because right. he wasn't down as the father. And Mike Gleason came in, who Paul didn't like, and he just passed by Paul and in the corridor, and he went in, and he held her hand, and Paul had to stand outside crying, looking at his, his baby girl being born when he wasn't there. And he couldn't say anything to anybody because uh, he was married to Nicola. This is the best day of my life. No, no. I Matters can't. become further complicated when Nicola gets pregnant too. You're going to be a daddy, Paul. I'm pregnant. And when Paul cracks and tells her about baby Rachel, the relationship finally falls apart. Rachel is my daughter. What did you say? I'm... I'm the father of Helen's child. Helen and Mike were getting married and Paul, drinking again alone in the bar, just decided this can't happen. And this is the woman I love. He's already been kicked out by Nicola and he went to hell with it. And he followed, went up to the church and it was a classic uh, graduate moment. May Michael and Helen always be true to each other. May they be one in heart and mind. May they be united in love forever. Through Christ our Lord. Helen. Helen. She ran from the altar and they uh, they didn't live happily ever after, but they did for a couple of years. Anyway. You go for me and your taboo, but One of my favourite characters of all time was Eunice, who was my mother-in-law, Joan O'Hara. I mean, she was just fantastic. And her character in Fair City, she was as mad as a hatter. So she was fantastic. She was one of my favourites of all time. And I just loved acting with her. Hiya, sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Neve Cassidy has left school and is now working for Leo in his taxi office. And it's not long before she's causing trouble again. She felt grown up, so she wanted to look grown up. So uh, Leo appeared in Carrickstown. And he was married to Sandy at the time, which wasn't his first wife, it was his second wife. And Sandy was very glamorous and was a redhead played by the lovely Cheryl Bradley. And I think what Neve saw in, in Sandy is what she kind of wanted herself. So she made a play for Leo. And Leo had no problem playing back. Um, and it got very steamy for a while. You know something, Neve? I think you're the kind of girl that my mother warned me about. Yeah? Well, is that good or bad? Oh, it's bad. Very, very bad. And it ended up with poor Neve getting pregnant. And I think that was the reality check that brought her back to herself. That, re that made her kind of realise, actually, there's, there's no actions without consequences. So that led to Neve deciding to have an abortion. And finally, Bella gets some happy news and manages to be a good father that Christmas. He was having a very bad time. He was out of work. He had no money. All he, he had a couple of selection boxes for the children. 
He buys a scratch card and he's in the mall and he's standing under the Christmas tree with a little cherubic angel at the top of it, right? And I think there's the last scene. Of